So I'd like to introduce you to Andrew Shirley Lama. She's going to give us an acknowledgement to country. And give her a big round of applause. First of all, I want to acknowledge and pay respect to Julian's father, John Shipton, wherever you are. Is that in there? Mr. Shipton! I want to pay tribute to and pay my respects to you as Julian's father. Okay? Okay, so... My name's Auntie Shirley, I'm a Demuroi Waka Waka woman, and today we stand on the land of the Gadigal people. But you know what? One of Australia's sons sits in a filthy prison languishing in another man's land, not our land, and he needs to be brought home now, or if not home, certainly to his children, because that is where this man belongs. So I don't know much about Whatever Julian did, but how dare they lock him up for speaking the truth? Because the truth always sets people free, and unfortunately has not set this man free. But we intend to support him in whatever way we can. So us blackfellas will be marching in in May, and we are, one of the banners will be bringing Julian home to his children, because he's a father and he needs to be with them. And uh, what I want to say to people here is black Australians, we're not America's Jackie Jackies and Black Berries. The white Australians might be, but not us black fellas. And, um, and just recently I thought about this Biden bloke, I thought he might be a bit different, but he's not. The first thing he does, does is bomb cereal. What does that tell you? He's a warmonger like the rest of them, aided and abetted by Australian politicians. And that's not on. So, um, in closing, I'd like to say that I, as a person, and when I was blackfellas, will be marching. We'll have a banner for you and for your son, and more important, his children, your grandchildren, because it's not right for a person to be separated from their children. I, myself, am a member of the Stolen Generations. I have a profoundly disabled son who lives away from me, so I know the pain of a child and of a mother. And what I say to people, or to whatever his name is, Gobo, um, how dare you do that to an Australian? How dare you do that? Just because he speaks the truth and doesn't speak with poor tongue like you. This is wrong. And it's a blight on this country, the fact that people from all over the world can stick up for this young man, and yet we have our own leaders kowtowing to the USA. So uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say. So I will tell you that we will have that banner bringing Julian home to his children. And that'll be sometime in, in May, because that is so wrong to deny a father the right to see his children. And I'm sure he's suffered enough over there. But I mean, when you look at, you can't but, but help wonder why, because they were the same people that sent convicts out here. So when you look at Australia today, it is, was and always will be a penal colony. Nothing changes with these people. And what in saying so, this country is not Chinese Australia, Arab Australia, not even America Australia. It's Aboriginal Australia and don't you forget that. And we intend to do a home run for this young man so that he is reunited with his loved ones. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Auntie. Uh, I should have introduced myself. My name's Ian Rose. I'm a member of Supporter Sergeant WikiLeaks Coalition. And I'm wearing a very old T-shirt, perhaps one of the first from the WikiLeaks shop. But I'd like to introduce you to Jacob Grek. Jacob Grek is an activist who's been on the campaign for as long as everybody. Uh, he's a journalist. Jacob's got a letter from John Porter to read out as well. So could you give him a big round of applause? That'd be great. Thank you, everybody. And my name's Jacob. I'm here from um, from Melbourne, part of Melbourne for WikiLeaks. And um, I've been one of the people who's in a tour um, with John Shipton and um, Graham Dunstan and Ryan and Tanaz and others um, 
travelling around the country. So the first thing I want, but the first thing we wanted to do, we were expecting to have John Pilcher join us today. Um, but unfortunately, he sent a message in his place and he's asked me to read it out. So this is from John. He says, I'm sorry I can't be with you today. It's always an honour to share a platform with John Shipton. When this struggle is over and Julian is free, the tireless, courageous campaigning of John Shipton will have a permanent place in our hearts. Yay! It's more than a decade since the United States and its collaborators set out to smear and kidnap a journalist whose work they couldn't control, coerce or censor. WikiLeaks offered us a freedom of expression that bowed to no master. The kind of freedom that the Americans have boasted about being sacred to them. It's the ultimate irony that they who claim to have invented this freedom are now committed to crushing it. If they win their wretched appeal in London and Julian goes to America, that freedom is lost. No truth teller is safe. That is why John's campaign is so important. He reminds us, never forget. He shames and persuades those in power. Today, he and I say this to Scott Morrison. If you can get Kylie Moore Gilbert released after 804 days in Iran, then you can get Julian Assange released after more than 10 years in Britain. It can be done. You know it can be done. Or is your Australia nothing but a frightened country? Is it a country fit for cowards who never speak up, who never do the right thing, who go along with what the bullies tell them? Is that it, Scott Morrison? Help free Julian, Prime Minister, and Australia begins to be a real place, free and independent. If you say nothing, do nothing, if you just carry on managing scandals, handing out warts and kissing the backside of the world's bullies, then you are not the leader of a free country. Break the silence, Scott Morrison. Bring Julian home now. And thank you, John. Now, I'm not going to talk much myself on a day like this with the rain threatening. That'd be a human rights abuse in itself. Listen to me prattle on. You've got speakers here who are a, a lot more around the subject with a lot more knowledge than I do. But one thing I do want to say, and that is when John first came to me with the idea of doing a tour through remote areas, coming through Sydney on our way to Canberra, I was realised I'd been in Melbourne too long perhaps because I doubted the efficiency of it. But for John and for Julian, of course, we did it. I've got to tell you that throughout regional Victoria, whether we're talking Castlemaine or Bendigo, um, up in New South Wales where we went um, Wagga Wagga, Albury, Goulburn, Bathurst, sorry if I've left anyone out, Katoomba, Hazelbrook, yesterday in Parramatta is a different story, it's in Sydney. But throughout the rural areas, we have been absolutely gobsmacked by the amount of people coming out and giving their support for this tour and for Julian Assange. And one thing I've got to say, I've found it's really given me a lot of hope, is the recognition, as you'll hear from other speakers, that this is not just about freeing Julian. Of course, that's our primary concern. We want to bring him home to Australia. But the other thing we want to free is Julian's legacy. It scares me silly that we have the possibility of when we bring Julian home, and it's a when, it's not an if, it's a when we bring Julian home, we want to bring him home to a country he can be proud of. A country where he knows his work has not been done in vain. His suffering has not been in vain. And we're concerned that we're asking everybody, everybody who comes here today, 
You're always asked to sign petitions. You're always asked to kick money in the tin. And of course, you can kick some money in the tin today. It's on the table there. But one important thing we want to ask you is when you go home tonight, not tomorrow, not Sunday, tonight, and all you people down there listening in Radio Land through the Community Radio Network, tonight, go to wikileaks.org. Look up your favourite politician. Doesn't matter what country. Look up your favourite corporation. Look up your favourite military, your favourite town, your school, and get the information, because that is what this is about. That is why Julian is locked up in a terrorist cell in a COVID-ridden jail in the old dark, because he's been providing us with information. And it's our duty to Julian, not just to set him free, not just to bring him home, but to make sure that his suffering, his work is not in vain. So that's why we're here today. We're going to have a lot of other speakers who can speak about various aspects of it. But that's all I wanted to say to, to you. Thanks for coming out and supporting the home run for Julian. Uh, thank you, Jacob. That was great. Now, of course, our next speaker is Lisa Johnson. She's a clinical psychologist, uh, very much part of um, Doctors for Assange. And always with great insights, so please make her welcome. So I first started researching and writing about Julian Assange after attending a rally like this, just down the road at the Town Hall, and John Pill just spoke at that rally, he gave a very powerful speech, and at the time um, Ecuador had cut Julian off from the outside world, and it was clear that things were taking a very alarming authoritarian turn. And for me, one of the most alarming things at that point was the resounding silence about that from a lot of the organisations and authorities whose job it is to protect our democratic rights from abuses of power like targeting and silencing a journalist. So I'm pleased to say that now, a couple of years later, that's really changed and, you know, changed dramatically. I mean, I think it's fair to say that there's an international human rights and press freedom consensus that Julian Assange should be free and he should be free now. You know, organisations from Amnesty International to Reporters Without Borders, UN bodies, uh, you know, legal experts, legal organisations, unions. I mean, I could stand here all afternoon naming the organisations, uh, politicians from all around the world who are unequivocally denouncing the US pursuit of Julian Assange, both on the grounds that it threatens all of our democratic rights and freedoms and on the grounds that it threatens Julian Assange's life and health. Um, you know, because the two things are inextricable. The life and health of our democracies rely on informed citizens. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's inseparable from the life and health of Julian Assange. So it was very upsetting at his extradition hearing last year to hear details of his really terrible state of health, his dire state of health. And that was particularly upsetting as a member of Doctors for Assange which is a group of over 200 doctors from all around the world. Um, some very eminent people amongst us, you know, um, someone who's on the executive committee of the World Psychiatric Association, someone who's headed up organisations that have won not one but two Nobel Peace Prizes. And we've been writing to governments since 2019, warning of, you know, the exactly the medical and psychological devastation that the court heard about at the extradition hearing last year. Uh, and in late 2019, we wrote to the Australian government and we itemised in quite a lot of detail the specific physical and psychological injuries that could be expected to occur as a result of the persecution and abuse being inflicted on Julian. And those were precisely the physical and psychological harms that the court heard about in the medical evidence. And the point about that is that we had no inside knowledge of Julian Assange's physical and psychological status. It was just obvious and therefore predictable and preventable that those harms would occur. Um, you know, particularly against that backdrop of medical neglect and fragile health in the Ecuadorian embassy. 
So then, at the extradition hearing, after the judge ruled against extradition, based on Julian's fragile state of health and the risks to his life, all a direct result of the years of persecution and abuse, she sent him back to prison for more. She sent him back to the very place that the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, or the conditions that they had deemed arbitrary, and that the UN Rapporteur on Torture had deemed torture. So it's no surprise at all that the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute has called his treatment shocking and excessive and likened it to the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. And it's no surprise that over 300,000 people tweeted the hashtag Assange after the Trump administration failed to pardon him. And imagine those 300,000 people here all shouting free Assange. You know, that gives you a level of, uh, an idea of the level of support that's out there. And it's no surprise that the Australian leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, has recently said enough is enough. So the Australian government would be on very solid ground if it said to the US government, look, we just can't turn a blind eye anymore. Uh, you know, even, we're, we're, the last, we're the last party to this that isn't opposing this extradition request. Even the UK court ruled against it. Our parliamentary colleagues from across the political spectrum are against it. The Australian people are against it. You know, the petition to free Julian Assange tabled in the Australian Parliament has over half a million signatures. The third largest petition ever tabled in the Australian Parliament. So the Australian government could easily say to the US government, we have to step in to protect the life and health of our citizen because the world is watching. And the Australian government could remind the US government that the Australian government has what's called a positive duty under the Convention Against Torture, which means it has an obligation to do something to protect its citizens when a finding of torture is made. And to keep silent is called acquiescence and consent under the Convention. And it's listed in the first sentence of the first article of the Convention Against Torture as part of the definition of torture. So it's at the heart of the prohibited activity. So the US government could say to the American government, we can't be acquiescent and consenting anymore. He's our citizen. He's convicted of nothing. You lost your case. It's time, high time, to free Julian Assange and drop the extradition request. Our next speaker, of course, is John Shipton. <laughs> you know, I cast my eye around and I see faces that are so familiar from every fight from the Vietnam War onwards. <laughs> and the darlings, darlings of the heart, really. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, so, there's a a meeting in Glasgow, a uh, climate meeting in Glasgow, every head of state will be there. The United States and it's the UK are preparing their uh, submission or their propaganda attack on the on values, okay? Values, the values of the United States Empire. And if you don't mind, we'll look at that a little bit. Because just down the road in London, in Belmarsh, is an illustration of the United Kingdom's values, Julian Assange. Now into the 11th year, coming up to his 50th birthday. Since March, nobody's able to pop in and say hello you know, shake his hand. The uh, jail's been infested with COVID the values. So Gideon Pollier is an Australian academic. He works in Melbourne. He published a book recently. He's an expert on excess deaths. He calculates that between six and seven million have died directly in the Middle East in the last 20 years, between six or seven million. 
these souls are grieved over by their relatives, their mums and dads, sons, daughters, uncles, aunts, grandfathers, and their friends. A pall of grief hangs over the Middle East. Brown University publishes a study which indicates that the last 20 years of the United States and its allies' activities in the Middle East have created 38 million refugees. Families, mothers, fathers. When I say refugees, it means us out of luck because somebody's ruined our country or wants something that we have and treasure. 38 million values they are. Just our activity alone in fighting for Julian's freedom gives those grieving people some element of repose. Well, they know that there are people who care. There are people who know. There are people who act in that. And there are people who have seen the work of Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks crew. Any one of these events that I describe, you can look up on WikiLeaks. Any one of the main actors, if you wish to call them that, you can look up on WikiLeaks. You can see the deals they made. You can see the suborning of decent people through blackmail, through bribery, bullying, intimidation, values. I don't want to speak too much more about the pressing things. They are facts and we shoulder them with our task to get Julian home. We shoulder them willingly and if I may say so, the task is a noble one. But I wish to indicate to you that we are not alone. 24 parliamentarians of good spirit form the Assange group. In representative government, these parliamentarians bring the concerns of their constituents into the parliament and the institution of parliament pursues the executive to right this wrong. A fine example of parliamentary action for us to observe. And all surrounding Julian Assange, a very good example. The sentiment, if I may use that word, the values that propel an upwelling of support for Julian right around the Western world. In the Bundestag, in Germany, prior to COVID, 29 cities each week had vigils for Julian Assange. In the Bundestag, they invited me to speak there, which I did and nobody fell asleep or anything like that. They actually clapped. <laughs> and they asked me to speak again and they gave Nils Melzer and I standing ovations. And I don't know who was most envious of the other, Nils or me, <laughs> counting them. But there's a cross-party group. Now we were the first here. Here in Australia, we were the first to realise a set of values. We realised that Julian Assange is a creation of this society formed within our bosoms. He is us, not separate. 
our values, which we fight for in the person of Julian Assange in this instant. There are many other fights that we can take on, but in this instance, that representation of our values in a living being is very important. I'll say just a little more. So that's in the Bundestag, they have a cross-party group. In Spain, there's a group of parliamentarians. In the UK, a cross-party group. In the Dial yesterday, that's the Irish Parliament, for those unfamiliar with the Gaelic expression. Yesterday, there was a, a Sinn Féin spokesperson said that the government must approach, must approach the American ambassador and the English ambassador. They have the expression in Ireland, United Ireland for Assange. Pretty good, huh? It's never been united for 800 years, but Julian has, again, values, our values in action. In Stockholm, I am welcomed there by hundreds of people and three of their parliamentarians. The same in Norway. The same in the American Congress. The same in New Zealand. So we are not alone, and that's an upwelling across the Western world, which, well, in my heart, will continue after Julian returns here to his family and society, an upwelling that will continue to establish proper values. And the seven countries that were destroyed in the last 20 years will have our attention and rehabilitation and apology. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We have Alison Bryanowski. It's a great honor to follow John and have this audience moved by what he just said. And it's hardly necessary for you to hear anything more from me, but I'll take Jen's place as best I can. In my working life, I used to be a diplomat. And when I couldn't stand that any longer, I did, did a few other things, including standing for the Senate for WikiLeaks. And I, I should have won, I got a really old t-shirt too. I should have won it. We didn't expect to win. We didn't expect to get anywhere and we didn't. But that's how I knew John Shipton because we traveled all over the place, just telling people what it was about, telling them why we were doing it, telling them we wouldn't win, but at least we would give the cause some publicity and we had a great time and I hope that it gave Julian um, a bit of support as well. He sure needs it now. You know you get told all the time when you go up to speakers and say well what can I do and they say go and go and talk to your local politician, go and write to your local member. They always say that and it's good advice. All right. Guess who my local member is? Dave Sharma. So I go and see Dave Sharma. Yeah. So I go and see one of my former colleagues, yeah? Um, I go and see Dave Sharma late last year. And I say, you're asking your constituents to come and talk about anything that's on their mind. I got something on my mind. I got two things on my mind. Yeah, right away, he said, what? I said, one is, we've got to change the war powers. Oh yeah, he says. And the other is, we've got to get Julian out of jail. He didn't concentrate on the war powers at all, as you can well imagine. That just went straight through to the keeper. But on Julian, he picked it up and he said, you shouldn't be doing that. I said, why? He said, you should be putting your energy into freeing Kylie Moore Gilbert. And I said, you are kidding. You are kidding. Kylie Moore Gilbert has been locked up for a year and a bit at that point. 
Julian going on for 11 years. Even if it was only just that, the relativities were so gross. And I pointed out to him, I didn't get a chance then, but I pointed out later in writing to him that Kylie Moore Gilbert was accused and arrested uh, for espionage in a country that has the death penalty and appalling conditions in prison. Julian is arrested on charges of, or is, wants to be extradited, they want to extradite him on charges of espionage and taken to a country that has the death penalty and appalling conditions of imprisonment. What is the difference? There is none. One is our noble ally to whom we are supposedly joined at the hip with all those values that John was talking about. And the other is Iran, which is not our enemy and has done absolutely nothing to deserve our enmity. So why are our governments so afraid, so willing to do things about Iran and so unwilling and afraid to take up the issue with either the UK or the United States? And that's why I could not possibly work for foreign affairs now. I would be absolutely useless to them as any kind of Australian diplomat because I am so disgusted with the behavior of my own country. And I told Dave Sharma that, and he didn't like it. But here's the point. Justice is supposed to be for everybody, including the Attorney General, eh? Justice is supposed to be, everyone is supposed to be equal before the law, except the ones who are facing American law and the ones who are facing Iranian law, and then it's quite different, right? So what are we all doing about this? Well, you're all here, and there are people all around the country, as John said, and in other countries, who understand the unfairness and the injustice and the actual danger to Julian, to his life, that is now on the cards. COVID is in that prison. By the way, has any of our newspapers, any of our media told you, they haven't told me, what is the infection rate in our jails? Do we know? Do we know what rate of deaths in prison from COVID we have? We don't know in Britain, except that we know that there are a lot of cases in Belmarsh. Now, there are really serious crimps in there. People who are locked up for awful crimes. Julian, as you know, is locked up for nothing. Nothing at all. And he is exposed to that risk, as you heard from, my, from our previous speaker. He is exposed to that risk so unjustly. And here we have a government which is bending over backwards and spending heaps and heaps of money just to save us from the virus. Well, what's wrong with saving Julian from the virus? I would very much like to know. I mean, why is his treatment different? Why is his treatment different from Kylie Moore Gilbert? Why do we treat Iran differently from the United States and the United Kingdom? Well, I went to ask a, 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 a senior opposition shadow minister that question and he said, it's the British legal system, the rule of law. And I said, you've got to be joking. But he wasn't. He wasn't. And Labour is no better than the government in this. It is very hard to get any of them to take the slightest interest. Why? Because they are they are joined at whatever part of their anatomy works to the United States as well, and they want to be in government, and they know that if they don't behave, the United States will overthrow their government. I can tell you, it's true. 
Thank you for your comment. Thank you, Alison. That was really nice and exciting. Uh, so our next speaker is Joe Liora, who's a journalist um, with Consortium News, who's trapped here on Holiday Island to our, our benefit. So please make him feel welcome. And would it be sufficient to be here today to defend a man who's been treated cruelly by two Western states and abandoned by another? Uh, would it have been enough to defend a son and a father? But we all know that this case is much bigger than one man's life. It goes to the very core of whether Western societies will protect what is left of democratic institutions, particularly the justice system and the press. Having had remote access to the proceedings at Old Bailey, uh, we at Consortium News heard Magistrate Vanessa Baretza pronounce the word discharge as in, I order the discharge of Julian Paul Assange. Those who want to see the man free for humanitarian reasons or on principle were right for that fleeting moment to rejoice. But then it was later that we questioned whether the word discharge had a different legal meaning than it does in the English language. For Beretta, as we know, inexplicably sent Assange back to the hellhole of Belmarsh after barring his extradition because of the state of his mind. And then we contemplated what Beretta's judgment meant for journalism. Even if Assange should defeat the American appeal, she upheld the criminalization of the profession. This is an immensely historic case because it is an historic first. It's the first time a publisher and a journalist has been indicted for espionage in the United States for the act of publishing defense information. The espionage laws in the US and Britain were written not only to outlaw classic foreign espionage, but so broadly as to make it possible to indict a journalist. Franklin Roosevelt and Richard Nixon had come close before in 1942 against journalists at the Chicago Tribune, and in 1973 against reporters at the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case. Now, Barack Obama nearly indicted Assange in 2011, but pulled back because his administration knew that to prosecute a journalist for publishing could invite a constitutional conflict with the First Amendment and turn the media against him. Well, Trump took that chance and it's now been endorsed by Joe Biden, who had a chance to drop this appeal and did not. And how has the media reacted to this? On the day of Assange's arrest, there were editorials that recognized the lethal threat to a free press. After that, there has been mostly silence. Thank you. After all, Assange has shamed the media profession. He's done the job they should have been doing, and he scooped them badly. For decades, with few exceptions, the media has cozied up to power and covered up their crimes. They've explained away the coups and the invasions and the surveillance as good for spreading democracy and protecting the West, especially America, from hyped up or non-existent threats. This is why so many people in the West find it so hard to support a journalist who exploded so many myths about their leaders, about their country, and about themselves. They've been led to believe that political repression and extreme secrecy only takes place in those other countries, the Soviet Union, Russia, China, and any developing countries that object to American bullying. Assange helped make it possible for Westerners to understand what is wrong with their governments and their aggressive foreign policy, but many don't want to know. I suspect many people walking by leaving their offices in Martin Place may not want to know, because they're attached to their national identities and turn on Assange for making them doubt what they believe are their government's good intentions, 
to spread democracy, for instance, rather than the reality of spreading its geostrategic and economic interests. It's time for people to shed their, this fake innocence and embrace universal human values, not the so-called Western values that John Shipton spoke about, and to defend Assange and the profession of journalism as it should be practiced and as he has. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm sorry about the achieving problems with our sound system there. Um, so, pretty much that's a wrap, everybody. But there's a few things I'd like to take home with you. That is, invite your friends to support Assange. Talk with your family about Julian's plight. And whether you're writing a letter to the MP, your local MP, asking them what they're doing, ask them to join the Parliamentary Friends of Assange. And it should be mentioned, there's a few Labour people in there, one of them being Julian Hill, a very interesting fellow. Um, now the other thing is we've got these amazing books. They are full of essays from artists and academics of all working fields, all from Australia, giving their perspective on Julian Assange and what WikiLeaks has meant to our society. You can pick one of these up for $40, and they will be signed by the Roadshow team, which is John Shipton, Graham Dunstan, Jacob Grek, and Ron Sierka. Thank you!